Martin Luther King. They asked him, how dare you come out against the president who signed the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1965. Johnson, they said, has done more for us than any president since Abraham Lincoln. Now they began with a fallacy that Abraham Lincoln had done so much for us. In fact, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed not because Lincoln was interested in, quote, freeing the slaves, but because white labor in the North was no longer interested in fighting for the freedom of enslaved workers in the South. So the Emancipation Proclamation allowed black labor, what W.E.B. Du Bois called the black proletariat, to fight for their own freedom. And had there not been 200,000 former enslaved Africans who joined the Union Army, the South would have won that war. So they, they made a major mistake from the beginning. The president that had done more for us since Abraham Lincoln. The slaves freed themselves. And they would have freed the South had Reconstruction not been overturned in 1877. I'll say that again. Black labor in freeing itself would have freed the South had Reconstruction not been overturned based upon a compromise between the, quote, liberal North and the racist South in 1877. Had Reconstruction not been overturned, there would have been no need for Martin Luther King to be in Memphis in 1968 when he was assassinated because the South would not have been the preserve of the Union Busters and the cold-blooded white supremacist. You see what I'm saying? So when they made the argument that Johnson had done more for the Negro than any president since Abraham Lincoln, they made another mistake. Lyndon B. Johnson didn't lead the civil rights movement. No, he sure did. He was a southerner himself. Sure was. As a senator, he stood against civil rights. Uh -huh. The Negro fought for their own civil rights and won their own civil rights movement. So the idea that Martin Luther King had to be loyal to Johnson because he signed legislation which was made inevitable by the upsurge of black folk and their allies in the labor movement was a phony charge. He had not betrayed Johnson. As Martin Luther King said, he was being consistent with his moral principles. And he said in that speech, he would not allow political expediency to make a butchery, these are his words, a butchery of his conscience. The second point, Martin Luther King said that in that speech he, hadn't, he wasn't gonna speak to the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong Many peace activists and politicians back then felt in order to be pro-peace, you also had to uh, lecture the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong about how to be Democrats. Martin Luther King said he didn't have anything to say to the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong. He wanted to talk to his own government. And I quote, the main purveyor of violence in the world. That's number two. Number three, Martin Luther King spoke of the rising poverty 
in the country at that time and said that the war in Vietnam and the military industrial complex were the enemy of the poor. And he said that the Johnson administration could not pursue a war on poverty and a war in Vietnam at the same time. Something would have to give. Now let's come again 43 years up to the present. According to government statistics, 150 million Americans, half of the American population, lives in or close to poverty. We are in a great depression. Let's not fool ourselves. 30 million unemployed. If 50% of the nation is in poverty, that means to extrapolate those numbers, 80% of African Americans live in poverty. Philadelphia is a black city. Let's face it. If you go anywhere in this city, you see, you see impoverished black men, women, and children get on the subways, sleeping in the subway, begging on the street. 80% most black unemployed are not even counted by the government because the government does not believe that they count anyway. Mm. Martin Luther King said as he went back to Memphis, so very interesting and so very profound in this large historical sense. He returned to Memphis to stand with sanitation workers who didn't have a union, didn't have a contract. In the union busting South, transcending the struggle for civil rights now going to the level of human rights. Labor rights, human rights, civil rights, and the struggle for peace. King goes back to the South. And he does, takes a page it seems, in action out of the great work of the greatest intellectual ever produced in this country, W.E.B. Du Bois. His magnum opus, his greatest work. Greatest work, but least known. Black Reconstruction in America. First chapter, the black worker. First chapter, the black worker. That's why the work is not known. <laughs> give, give another title to the first chapter, you might know about it. <laughs> I'm gonna stop. <laughs> what the, what did Du Bois say? These were not slaves, these were workers. Unpaid, owned as property, but workers. Ultimately, he defines the slaves as a black proletariat. He argues in that work, and King's life is a text confirming the thesis of Du Bois' Black Reconstruction. Du Bois said that the slaves, as they saw the Union Army come in the South, and as Lincoln signed that Emancipation Proclamation, the slaves entered upon what Du Bois calls, and this is, by the way, the fourth chapter, a general strike. A general strike, I guess that's the third chapter. So if you take the first and third chapter, no, the fourth chapter, the first and fourth chapter, there's no way the establishment of this country is going to tell you to read Black Reconstruction. <laughs> A general strike, and he says, of the four million enslaved Africans, 500,000, uh, participated in a general strike where they stopped working and thus destroyed the capacity of the South to pursue the war against the North. <laughs> King was moving to an occupation of, of Washington. That's what the Poor People's March was. 
to occupy Washington. They were not going to leave Washington. <coughs> but then what was also present in the logic of this occupation of, of Washington called the Poor People's Campaign? What Du Bois talked about in the fourth chapter of Black Reconstruction, a general strike of the poor. Close the country down. Close the country down. Stop the war makers. Don't finance war and take from the people. How, and this is King, the great Christian morality. King knew about Nazi Germany. He studied it at Crozier Theological Seminary. He knew what Christians normally do. That is, acquiesce in the face of evil. The Christians, Protestants and Catholics in Nazi Germany acquiesced to Hitler. There were only a few known as the anti-Nazi Church of Germany in the forefront, a young theologian who had studied here at Union Theological Seminary had gone to Abyssinia Baptist Church in Harlem and been inspired by black spiritualism, that African movement within Christianity, goes back to Germany, commits himself to fight Hitler. Ultimately, he and his colleagues decide that while Christians believe in pacifism and love, that at some point a huge evil has to be stopped by any means necessary. They organize a plot to assassinate Hitler. They fail. 45 days before the end of the war, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is executed by the Nazis, only in his 30s. King looks at that. He looks at the failure of Christianity, how Christianity too often interacts, intersperses with white supremacy and white nationalism and imperialism. You see what I'm saying? And therefore he uses the concept, the fierce urgency of now. A Christian is not what a Christian says, a Christian is what a Christian does. I'd like to just end on this. This economy is not going to get better. No, no, it's not. This is the great lie. Both sides in this presidential, excuse me, Henry, farce, are going to talk about how they're going to create jobs. They're not going to create jobs. The system that we live under is unsustainable. And the more unsustainable it becomes, the more anti-people it becomes. This is a hateful system run by hateful men and women. We cannot lose sight of that. This is a, and I agree with Henry about this, this is a year of decision. Either we fight or we don't. They have a strategy of total war against the working people of this country. We cannot have a strategy of partial fight back. It has to be total fight back. No matter what it takes, no matter what the sacrifice is, and no matter how long it takes. As quiet as it's kept, we are on the cusp of fascism in this country. You don't sign a defense authorization bill and say that the United States, quote, homeland is part of the global, uh, global battlefield against terrorism. And the government, in this, in this instance, the army, can sweep up opposition that they call terrorists and imprison them as long as they want. 
Add to that the two million already locked up. Hello. Two million more under the control of the criminal justice system. And Let's talk about 6% African American males in this society, 50% locked up. Let's go to some of these neighborhoods in Strawberry Mansion, Southwest Philadelphia, where ain't no 8.5% unemployed, 100% unemployed. 100% unemployed. 100% been locked up. This is a dire situation. An economic system and a political system that have turned against the people. This is not democracy. Let's not fool ourselves. <laughs> Finally, if you take a measure of the men and women that run this country, what is your stand on peace? Well, I believe in war so on and so forth. What is your stand on poverty? Well, I believe in the austerity budget. Cut. What is your position on unions? Well, I think unions are, are bad for competition. What is Democrats and Republicans? The same answer. No The same answer. If I'm wrong, somebody straighten me out up here. I can't. The, both sides saying the same thing. One side say I'm going to do it right away. The other side say I'm going to do it a little bit slower. Death by a thousand cuts. But it is, it's really, this is, this, is, this is where the spirit of Martin Luther King lives. This is where the spirit of the great abolitionist John Brown lives. This is where the spirit of the future of our people lives. And just one other person's name I'd like to mention here. And he has to be in our hearts, in our minds, in our speeches, in everything we do, the great Mumia Abul Jamal. I want to underline the great Mumia Abul Jamal. They know more about Mumia in Paris, France, than we do in Philadelphia, although he's from North Philadelphia. The FOP and the political establishment that we put in power make sure that we do not hear his voice or his name. Mumia Abu-Jamal is one of the great African-American and American leaders of the 20th century. Put him up there with everybody that you know. Especially in the last 40 years, there ain't no comparison to him. 30 years in solitary confinement, unbroken. 30 years where he could not touch another human being. Mother died, couldn't go to the funeral. Sister died, couldn't go to the funeral. Grandchildren born, can't touch them. 30 years in solitary confinement. But he continued to speak. His spirit was not broken. That is leadership. By example. That's not leadership by talk. That's leadership by example. Facing the most vicious and ruthless prison system, legal system, penitentiary system in the world. Let's not be fooled by the rhetoric. He faced them down. They were forced to overturn the death penalty. This DA here, and who is he? <laughs> Said that Mumia should be killed and he would do everything he could to kill Mumia. What kind of man is he? Black, so-called? <laughs> Now Mumia is not on death row, but they got him in the hole. In fact, his situation now is worse than he was on than when he was on death row. So he has to be in our hearts. He represents the best. And if we honor Martin Luther King and his spirit, 
Let us fight for peace. Let us fight for justice. Let us fight to free the imprisoned. Let us fight for the poor. Let us fight for Mumei Abu Jamal.